Um, this is a Schumann pond. Uh, to give you a perspective, if you look at page 12, that's page 12, see a Schumann pond up here? We're about 1,500 to 2,000 feet away from the sewage disposal beds here, which are obviously where we just came from, all right? Um, the water table contours are shown uh, in here. That uh, water tower you see over there is on the base, uh, but we're off the base now, obviously. Um, a Schumann pond is, um, is typical of, uh, of ponds on the Cape. Uh, it's a glacial kettle pond. And what that means is that you can imagine uh, when the ice sheets were here and they, they were advanced all the way to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, then they retreated. And we use the word retreat rather loosely. They don't actually, the ice doesn't grind backwards. You know, what happens really happens is that the, the ice uh, doesn't advance as fast as it's melting away and eventually it sort of rots and gets, you know, melts away and leaves blocks temporarily and then the blocks eventually melt away. And then there's a new front that's, that occurs when the ice is advancing at the same rate it's melting. So that's what happened is the ice began to advance more slowly than it was melting so it began to recede. The front began to recede to about here and then uh, for some period of time it stayed here and dumped some sands and gravels. Well, when it did that, you know, those sands and gravel outwash is coming out ahead of it like you see in the pictures in Alaska or Greenland or New Zealand. There were ice blocks left out ahead that hadn't melted yet and they got buried in the sand. So what happens, you have this beautiful plain of sands and gravels with these braided streams, but buried underneath are blocks of ice that hadn't had a chance to melt yet when they got buried. And they gradually, over the next couple thousand years, melted out. And when they did, they left a depression. And if the depressions are deep enough, the water table intersects them and they fill with water. So these are actually locations of ice blocks that were left behind as the glacier melted that's later on collapsed in. Does that make sense to everybody? The other way I like to look at it is if you go to the beach at low tide, the ocean beach at low tide, and you dig a little hole with your hand, eventually it fills up with water. You've intersected the water table and you made yourself a little kettle pond. Okay. So what's unique about these ponds is that although some of them have small streams coming out of them, uh, for the most part they're groundwater fed by direct discharge of groundwater, and groundwater leaves them on the outflow side. They're called groundwater flow-through ponds. Right? Um, and a Schumann pond is one of those. This really reflects the position of the water table in this area. So the pond level right now is about 44 feet above sea level. That's about the average water table around the lake. Right? So it's really, a, I think of it as an outcrop of the water table. Right? Um, the reason why we stopped here is uh, that's the map of the sewage plume I showed you before. And see this little shared, shaded area up near the pond that says area of phosphorus contamination? That's basically between us and the lake and, and the sewage plant. Um, one of the contaminants of concern in sewage effluent is phosphorus. Uh, a lot of surface water, fresh waters, um, the ecosystems, uh, the productivity of the ecosystems are limited by the availability of phosphorus, which of course is a, a micronutrient that you know is essential to life. So, a lot of algae and, uh, and macrophytes, plants, uh, would grow if there was enough phosphorus, but their the growth is limited by the availability of phosphorus. There isn't enough in the natural systems. So the waters remain relatively clear, which we consider good, and clean, which we consider good, and there aren't a lot of weeds and algae, which we consider good. It makes it nice for swimming, fishing, whatever else. If you begin to add a phosphorus source to a typical freshwater lake in New England or in most places, what happens is you sort of take the lid off of that limit, and now the bacteria, or not the bacteria, the algae can begin to bloom. You guys have heard of algal blooms. Okay, so there's a real concern about the fate of the phosphorus coming out of the old sewage plant. Now, phosphorus is unique as compared to say nitrate or chloride or boron in that it has a strong affinity to stick to the iron oxides that coat the sediments and make them brown. Right? So phosphorus likes to adsorb to the iron oxides to the point where if I take a packet of water in the plume somewhere and I cut out a one cubic foot piece of aquifer, sand, and water together, and I look at all the phosphorus in that packet, something like 99% of it is absorbed to the sediments, and only a little bit of it is in the water. It's like the tip of the iceberg is what's in the water. The phosphorus loves to stay on the sediments. The result is that the phosphorus moves much more slowly than the other contaminants. So even though the water is moving at one to two feet per day, the phosphorus is what we call greatly retarded relative to other species. It doesn't move very fast. Right? The analogy I like to use, if, if you guys haven't, you know, haven't been exposed to this before, and if you have, you'll have to forgive me because it's kind of Mickey Mouse, is uh, when you get in your car and you drive from Boston to New York, it's 200 miles. And you, know, you do the math in your head and you go, I'm going to go, I'm going to average 60 miles an hour. You know, it's going to take me three hours and it always takes you five hours because you stop at the rest area for a while. 
and so your average speed is lower even though when you're in the car you're moving 60 miles an hour you know you have to average your speed for the trip well phosphorus is in the rest area 99 percent of the time so it takes a long time to make the trip okay so in the 60 years that disposal occurred the toe of the plume at a foot a day if you do a foot a day you know times 60 years it's made it all the way to the ocean we can track the the signature of the sewage plume all the way to the ocean but the phosphorus in 60 years only made it about to here in fact if we could drill wells in great detail along this beach, and we've done that in some places, the, the toe of the phosphorus plume is right about where that ramp is, literally. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. So if you drill a well on this side of the ramp, you're in phosphorus, and you go to the other side of the ramp, and you're out of the phosphorus plume. So it's only made it about 1,800 feet in 60 years. So it's greatly retarded in its movement. Go ahead. So the, uh, because it's moving so slowly, the phosphorus being eliminated from the toe of the algae, well, that, that's where the rub comes in. It's in the groundwater, the concentrations of phosphorus are pretty elevated. And even though that's only at the tip of the iceberg, it's still milligrams per liter in the water. So it doesn't sound like much, but those are huge numbers when it comes to fertilization of a lake. So they're standing by for a eutrophication for Well, the, we'll get to that in a second, okay? That's, we'll show you what they've done, all right? So, um, on page 13, I just, I just want to reemphasize this, this whole notion of these groundwater flow-through ponds. Uh, this is just a cartoon, obviously. Here's our kettle hole where the ice block was underneath here melted out. We have a water table on both sides. If you're on the upstream side of the pond, the water level is actually higher than the lake level. Groundwater is flowing up into the pond bottom, discharging on, into the pond. And on the downstream side of the lake, groundwater is actually being fed by the pond water going into the beach. So there's actually a passage through. And of course, if you get deep enough, this pond's only about 60 feet deep. The aquifer is 300 feet deep. There's some water that doesn't quite get in the lake, passes beneath it, all right? So there's, there's an aspect of flow like that. Right now, you're standing on the groundwater inflow side. Ooh. Yeah, but we're gonna bring that stuff with us. So probably the sand, the sand and the, uh, the little Henry sampler that's in there. There's a little, the little. I think I have one over here. We'll just take this one. Just the sand. I don't even get by with everything else. Um, so what you have is you're on the groundwater inflow side of the lake here. If you could uh, take off your shoes, and I don't recommend it right now, and dig your feet into the sand right here, two or three inches, it'd be really cold, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the average temperature of the groundwater on the Cape because you're in a groundwater discharge area. You go on the south side of the lake over there, that's the outflow side. The water's actually going and infiltrating their beach over there and going on. So the water is, the, the sand isn't cold over there. In fact, in the winter time, there's an area here about 10 feet from the shore that never freezes because you have heated groundwater coming in and discharging, whereas it freezes right up onto the beach on the south side. So really good evidence of groundwater inflow, all right? All right. So if you look at page 14, this is a map of phosphorus in the aquifer. And concentrations in the groundwater get up around five or six milligrams per liter. And with that kind of groundwater discharge coming into the lake, the numbers of kilograms per year, when you add it up, it's like putting in about uh, 170 kilograms per year of phosphorus into the lake. So it's about uh, almost 340 pounds. It, was, it would be like you were going to Home Depot or Ace Hardware and buying fertilizer for your lawn and coming over here and dumping in three or four hundred pounds of fertilizer in the lake every year. So even though it's only a few milligrams per liter added up over many liters, it's a, it's a very large load. In fact, they think that about 80% of the phosphorus load to this lake is from the sewage plume. And this lake is among the more eutrophic lakes on the Cape. They've had algal bloom problems and they attribute it to the basis wastewater plant. So that even though the phosphorus has hardly moved at all relative to the whole length of the plume, they put the plant in about the worst place they could have from a phosphorus point of view. A direct shot to the lake, only 1,500 feet. And so unfortunately, you know, there was enough time for it to get here. If they disposed of it a little bit further to the west, it would have missed the lake. But that, you know, you can't blame them for what they did in the 40s. All right. So let's, uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to walk up along the shore to where the phosphorus is coming in. It's not that exciting, but i got a few things to show you there, yes? Why in general does the team not divert and go through the pond? It seems like this would be a low conductivity and it, area. High conductivity area, right? Or high, yes. And that's exactly what happens. The pond is a lot like the well I was talking to you about. It's like a huge well. 
So it actually captures a lot of water. It actually pulls water into itself. But when I look at, say, this picture, it looks like the plume is just grazing the side and not really going through it. Well, but it does. Uh, a, a significant part of it discharges the Fisherman's Cove right here. But the, 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 if you, if you uh, look at the water table map in detail and did groundwater flow simulation, the, the sewage beds extended about 1,500 feet to the west when the plant was really operating at its max. And there are flow lines, when they were disposing it as far away from the pond as you can, that graze the pond and keep going. So they, they sort of had the, if they, if they dispose of all the sewage to the east, they would have all gone in the lake. There'd be no plume to the south. If they dispose of it all further to the west in the beds that they had available to them, none of it would have gone in the lake. It would have just come by the lake and, and missed the lake, cause just because of the nature of the flow pattern. There's got to be a divide somewhere. But they happen to put it on both places. So they created a plume and polluted the lake at the same time. <laughs> Which is great for me. <laughs> so let's walk up the shore a bit. 